Well, as we move into our message today, we are going to tread lightly because we are going to address one of the most dreaded questions that we all face. What's for dinner? <laughs> this is a question that destroys relationships. It brings you to your knees with being overwhelmed with the enormity of the task, right? It's a question that leads to a host of other questions, doesn't it? Like, who's cooking? What else do we have on the calendar today? Are we eating together or are we eating in shifts? Are your parents coming? Maybe we should go to their house. Wait, should we do takeout? I, I, don't, I don't know. Is there, is there anything defrosted? Do we have any leftovers? Oh, let's just go out. Where should we go? <laughs> and it, it just keeps going, right? For something that is so routine, so everyday, it can be such a loaded question, can't it? Especially in those times in life where you find yourself on the go, when the schedule is more crowded, when you have so many demands on your life, so many places you want to be. How do you get the quality, healthy, budget-friendly meals? How do you eat well on the go? Now, as much as this is a very real problem for our bodies, many of us are living this problem every day, it is, and maybe even a greater problem for our souls. Since our lives are always on the go, how can we feed our souls well? How can we get what it is that we need in order to endure the ups and downs, the uncertainties, the twists and turns that life throws at us? How can we feed our soul so that we're not always reacting to the moment, but can have a steadiness that can carry us through? How can we feed our souls well on the go? This is at the heart of this new series that we're starting tonight that we're calling How to Eat Well on the Go. And in this series, we're, we're in this series because as we started thinking about where are we in the midst of the year, right? Summer is starting soon. Today is like an incredible preview of summer, isn't it? And our schedules shift in summer, don't they? Other things start putting demands on us, right? The, right, the, the vacations and the beach, I think if you listen quietly that it's calling your name, isn't it? And, and, and grandkids or grandparents are, are vying for your attention. How can we feed our souls well when maybe you're not even able to be in worship in person? Now, as a side note, you can always worship with us on our live stream or after the fact. You can go to YouTube or to our Facebook channel. It's always available to you, so a little shameless plug. A great way to stay connected to this community, but it's not the same. And, and even if you're able to be in worship every single week of every single year, that's not actually enough to truly feed your soul to make it through everything that life's going to throw at you. And you know it. And so in this series, we want to really be intentional about thinking about what is it that we need to feed our souls and then really get very practical how do we actually do it so that we can eat well, even if we're on the go. And so today, we're going to be talking about what do we feed on and specifically, what do we feed on daily? And so we're going to jump into John chapter 6, and if you'd like, you can follow along on the screen if you'd like, but this is God's word for us together. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes, this is the words of Jesus, by the way, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, 
Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Let's pray as we move into this together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for this gift of the scriptures that you use to speak into the very real circumstances of our lives. In these moments, we want to hear from you. Lord, we want to know how to feed our souls well. And so in this moment, will you give us wisdom and insight? Will you help us hear clearly? And even more, will you give us what we need to respond? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So Jesus, just before this passage that we read, he had just fed miraculously thousands of people with just a couple of loaves of bread and fish. I've heard that story before, I'm sure. And now the crowd is following him. But earlier in chapter 6, Jesus basically calls them out. He says, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Right? He's calling them out. He's saying, you just want more to eat. You want the free lunch. Like you're not really interested in what the miraculous signs actually mean and what it's going to demand of you. You just want another meal and you see me as your meal ticket. And yet, at the same time, even as he calls them out, he instead plays on their hunger, their desire, and goes to their deeper desire and offers them a different food, doesn't he? And so what does Jesus offer them? His body and his blood. His flesh and his blood. Now, understandably, they are arguing with him in this moment, right? They're like, how can this guy give us his flesh to eat? And they're not just asking that because, like, how could he? Be? I mean, he's right there. He could physically, I guess, let them start nibbling on his arm. They're asking this from a much deeper place because their entire heritage of faith would have said this is wrong. Not just that cannibalism is wrong, but the fact that he's talking about drinking and eating blood. Like, this went against every one of their sensibilities as Jewish people. Their entire dietary system was built on basically the premise of make sure all of the blood comes out of the meat because the blood is sacred. And so they wouldn't even eat, have eaten the blood of animals. And now Jesus is talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Understandably, right after he says this, a whole bunch of them bail out because they're like, this is just too much. <laughs> they kind of missed the point. So what does, he, what does he mean? Does he mean cannibalism? I mean, let's just make sure this is abundantly clear. No. Okay, Jesus is not inviting cannibalism. So what does he mean? It takes really a careful reading of, of what John has presented and what Jesus says to help us understand clearly. In verse 54, he said, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And in verse 47, he says, whoever believes has eternal life. And so if in both cases they have eternal life, these are the same activities. Does that make sense? Both result in eternal life. They're one and the same thing. Eating his flesh, drinking his blood, believing are one and the same thing. Well, but how is, how is that one and the same? Tom Wright is a, uh, N.T. Wright is a commentator, a theologian, and in his commentary on John in this passage, he remembers back to a story of King David. 
And King David, as he was on the run because King Saul was trying to kill him, he had this band of warriors that came around him. And out of these incredible warriors, there were three in particular that rose above all the rest. And at one point along the way, King David expresses how thirsty he is. He has this insatiable thirst and how he craves water from the well in Bethlehem. Well, that's a problem because the enemy armies are all over Bethlehem. And these three over here, the king, say his desire out loud, and without really the king knowing it, he takes off. He go, they go, or they take off. They go into Bethlehem. They sneak in. They bring water back from the well to King David. And the king, realizing what has happened, what do you think he does? Refuses to drink it. Because, as he says, how could I possibly drink your blood? In other words, how could I be the sole beneficiary of you risking your life just to give me some cold water? He understood the, the powerful gift that they had given him, and he understood that he didn't want to be the sole beneficiary, that people would just, on a whim, start risking their life in, in ridiculous ways. And, and so we're, we're thinking about he benefited from their blood. He would have benefited from their sacrifice. And so Jesus is saying, to believe is to believe that you will benefit from my sacrifice. But whereas it wasn't just the risk of Jesus' body and his blood, like those three warriors, we know that Jesus was predicting that he would in fact go and he would suffer and he would die on that cross. Where he would bleed, where his flesh would be torn apart, where he was inviting all to come to benefit. Well, what's the benefit? David's benefit would have been some cold water. Well, Jesus made it clear, right? Whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, will have what? Eternal life. What's eternal life? You know, et eternal life is a really loaded phrase. And on one hand, we automatically think of eternal life as kind of never ending, which is an appropriate way to think about it, by the way. But it's also only a piece of the picture. See, when John talks about eternal life over and over and over again, he's talking about so much more than that. He's talking about a quality and a substance of life that is of eternal, infinite value, not just infinite in time frame. It's an abundant, overflowing, incredible life that is never ending. And specifically, it is a life in relationship with God because God is the giver of every good gift and it is an eternity of intimacy with God. It's not just time, it's quality, it's beauty. It's a life that's an eternal, never-ending life of meaning, of security, of joy, of peace, of belonging, of deep satisfaction. It's this life of such infinite value we can't even fully wrap our heads around. But man, do our souls not crave it and thirst after it like as if you've been running around all day today and haven't had a drink of water. We long for this kind of life that will satisfy the depths of our souls. And Jesus is saying, I have it for you. I have it. But he makes this incredible statement. He says, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Just such an interesting phrase that he stuck in the middle of this statement. My flesh and my blood are real, as opposed to what? As opposed to fake, as opposed to artificial. Right? I, I was just looking at this because I was curious when I started thinking about this, that um, GoodRx, on their website, they were talking about artificial sweeteners. And there's a lot, of, a lot of studies out there about artificial sweeteners, and they're not completely conclusive, but some of the studies actually indicate that Lots of people who try to bring on artificial sweeteners as a way to lose weight experience unintended consequences. Some of these studies indicate that, that artificial sweeteners, though they reduce calories, 
There's evidence that they increase appetite, they increase weight, they disrupt gut health, and they put you at risk for type 2 diabetes. So this food substitute that's supposed to be this solution, this hoped for, right, this hoped for satisfaction ultimately makes things worse. And Jesus is saying, I have the real thing, but you keep substituting all sorts of other things and it's only making it worse. And we're substituting all sorts of things at different times in our lives, looking for that kind of eternal life, that life that is gonna be rich and full and beautiful and complete. What are you substituting? I mean, we each have so many different temptations, so many different things that we're drawn to that we start to believe this is what, this is really what's going to give me life. If we reach this level of comfort, if we reach this kind of status, if we can just have security and we can know that the threats are, are, are all at bay, then it'll be okay. If we can have beauty or strength or athleticism or someone's attention or affection, if, if we can have sex or if we can have family harmony, if we can have the, the love and acceptance and cherish of another, like what is it that you say in your heart of hearts when you look at it, man, that's it. <laughs> if I could just have that. And maybe you have it right now, and so you're like, oh, I don't know. Because maybe everything's good. So you may not know it's there until it's threatened. Because health might be good today, and your family might be good today, and tomorrow it changes, and suddenly it's like, wait a second. That was, I guess that was a food substitute. And Jesus is saying, ah, my flesh, my blood, this is real food. This is real drink, because it can really satisfy. And there's a sense in, in what Jesus says here that this is like a one-time invitation. It's like, come on, right? Anybody who eats, eats my flesh, drinks my blood, here you go. Here's the gift. Here is life. It is yours for the taking. I, I, enjoy. There is salvation for you. There is eternal life for you. There is an eternal intimacy of God available to you. And, and yes, I, that's absolutely true. And that because it can't be taken away because it was based on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so why is it that so often we just still feel unsatisfied? We still feel hungry. It's because as much as the gift is given once, we have to eat daily. I just think, how, how long could you go? How many days could you go if you just stopped eating now? You could probably be okay tomorrow. Maybe the day after that, probably be feeling it a little bit. Maybe get a little hangry. At some point, we, we know where that ends, right? No food, no drink, we're all on the same page? Okay. See, this is part of what Exodus 16, the first reading for the day, was trying to tell us, trying to demonstrate to us, right? That was the, the story that, that came in the time of God's people where they were in the desert. They had just been brought out of Egypt, and God is leading them through this wilderness of desert, and he's promising to bring them up to the promised land. And it's been like 18 seconds since they left Egypt, and they're like, we're hungry, are we there yet? It's like the worst road trip ever. <laughs> and so they're grumbling. And God graciously listens to their grumbling, and what does he do? He says, okay, fine. I'm going to give you meat every evening, and I'm going to give you bread every morning. Here's what I want you to do. Go out every morning, and what do they find? They find that bread has literally fallen from heaven. The dew on the ground has turned into flakes of bread. This is what manna is. Manna literally means, what is it? So, because they didn't know. And he said, go out, get enough for today. How many people are in your house? Make sure everybody get enough. Because God's like, hey, I'm going to provide it absolutely enough for every single one of you. You will be satisfied. I promise you. So everybody get enough. Take it in. Eat it throughout the day. And then what I want you to do is I want you to go out tomorrow. I want you to do it again. Well, some of them thought they were smarter than God, right? You ever been there? No, you haven't been, I'm, I'm sure. They're like, sweet, look at all this extra. 
right? Like it's as far as we can see. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take like double time because you know what? We'll work a little harder today, but then we've got an easy street tomorrow, right? No work tomorrow. So what happens when they wake up in the morning? Nasty, right? Did you remember that everything they had left over was filled with maggots? Yeah, yeah, picture that for a second. Take you back to like, never mind. It's rotting and it's disgusting. Right? They, they thought that they could live off of yesterday's effort today. They thought they could get all that they needed for tomorrow today. And God wanted them to understand that, no, no, no. This is an ongoing, trusting relationship every single day. You're going to show up and you're going to have to trust that I'm going to show up. No hoarding. We can't live, our soul can't thrive off of our interaction and relationship with God yesterday. We've got to be engaged today. See, as much as Jesus was, said there's this one-time gift of my flesh and my blood, he also says, and those who feed, those who feed on me remain in me. There's this ongoing nature of remaining connected, remaining in me, and I will remain in them, right? It, it's this ongoing, everyday need to continue to feed our soul on the reality of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, the good news of what God has done for us, and we need it every single day because that is ultimately what is going to satisfy. That is ultimately what eternal life is, and we possess it not just after we die, we possess eternal life here and now, and it extends on forever. So how do we eat well on the go? We eat every day of the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ. How do we do that? That's what the rest of this series is going to be about. Very practical ways to do that. Historically, these have been talked about in the church, in the traditions, as, as spiritual disciplines, spiritual practices. And I know some of you hear that word and you're like, ah! disciplines. That's awful. And, but here's, here's what I want you to hear tonight. The spiritual disciplines that we're going to talk about and so many others that exist that we're not going to talk about in these coming weeks, they exist so that we can choose what we're going to eat every day. That we can actually participate in this eternal life relationship with God. That we can choose how our soul will be nourished no matter what else is happening around us. No matter where we are. No matter our circumstance. No matter what somebody does or doesn't think. No matter if all of the substitutes that we've tried in the past are failing us again. We can nourish our soul now. And we can actively choose what to eat. And that's what the disciplines are about so that our life can be transformed, that we're no longer captive to the ups and downs, but that we are fed well, nourished by our God. John Ortberg shares a story of a, that a friend of his told him, a friend named Tom Schmidt, in, in Ortberg's book, The Life You've Always Wanted. And, and Tom writes this, he writes about going to a state-run convalescent hospital. He says, it's classically understaffed. It's overfilled with senile and helpless and lonely people just waiting to die. It's dark. He says, it smells of sickness and stale urine. And Tom talks about going there once or twice a week for four years. He never wanted to go there. Every time he left, it was this sense of incredible relief. But one day, he recounts walking down a hallway that he didn't remember ever walking down before. This hallway seemed to be the hallway where it was like the worst of the worst cases. People strapped onto carts or wheelchairs looking completely helpless. He talks about nearing the end of the hallway where he sees an old woman strapped into a wheelchair. And his words, her face was an absolute horror. The empty stare and white pupils of her eyes let him know that she was blind. The large hearing aid over one ear also told him that she was probably almost deaf. 
One side of her face he could actively see was being eaten by cancer. She had a discolored running sore covering one cheek that had pushed her nose out of place that was causing her jaw to be distorted. And of course, as a result, she was drooling. This was Mabel. She was an 89-year-old woman at the time. She had been in this convalescent home for 25 years. As he tells the story, he doesn't know why he decided to go up to her that day, but he put a flower in her hand and said, here's a flower for you, happy Mother's Day. Now, she held the flower up, she tried to smell it, and then as she spoke, it was a little bit garbled, but actually he could tell that her mind was sharp and he was able to make out what she was saying. She said, thank you, it's a lovely flower, but can I give it to someone else? I can't see, you know, I'm blind, right? He said, of course, and he pushed her down the hall looking for another patient. He was able to find another patient. And as Mabel held out that flower to the patient, she said, here, this is from Jesus. That's when he started to realize that this was not just any ordinary person. He started to learn her history learned that she grew up on a small farm until her mom had died. And then she had to run that farm alone until the blindness and the sickness sent her to this convalescent hospital. And for 25 years, she had been getting weaker and sicker with constant headaches and backaches and stomach aches and, of course, the cancer. And they became friends, and he began to visit her once or twice a week. She'd often offer him a piece of candy or a tissue. Sometimes they would read from the Bible. And remarkably, as he would read, she would begin to word for word recite the passage that he was reading. He'd sometimes bring a book of hymns and they would sing these songs and she'd know all of the words. She wouldn't ever speak of her loneliness or her pain except for as she connected it to lines in certain hymns or certain scriptures. Tom talks about how during one hectic week of his, he was so frustrated because his mind was pulled in all of these different directions and he couldn't seem to focus. And he, he found himself, this question kind of popped in out of the blue. He wondered to himself, what does Mabel have to think about hour after hour, day after day, week after week, not even able to know if it's day or night. So he went and he asked her, said, Mabel, what do you think about when you lie here? And she said, I think about my Jesus. And Tom sat there for a moment. Difficult to even think about Jesus for five minutes. He asked her, well, what do you think about Jesus? She began to reply deliberately, and he started taking notes. I think about how good he's been to me. He's been awfully good to me in my life, you know. I'm one of those kind who's mostly satisfied. Lots of folks wouldn't care much for what I think. Lots of folks would think I'm kind of old-fashioned, but I don't care. I'd rather have Jesus. He's all the world to me. And then she began to sing a hymn. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. How does a person come to have eternal life, possess eternal life in that kind of circumstance, in that kind of situation? How could she continue to be a person filled with such hope, such joy, such meaning and purpose, a heart to serve and to give? How's it possible? How could she know the scriptures by memory and the psalms and the hymns by heart? She'd been feeding on Jesus day by day by day. All those years of her life. And so even now, even then in that hospital, she could continue to feed 
She could continue to nourish her soul. She could eat well, and she could experience the reality of eternal life even as her body deteriorates and the world around her seems to shrink. Man, it was expansive in her soul. See, this is what the disciplines are for so that we can choose how to feed our soul, even when we're on the go, so that we too can possess eternal life that Jesus Christ has bought us. But let's not make this passage only a metaphor. See, in John's gospel, he's the only one of the gospel writers that does not recount the Last Supper. That time, the night before Jesus was betrayed, when he was gathered with his disciples, John doesn't capture that moment in the same way as the other biographers. It seems like he's content to allow this moment in Jesus's ministry to point ahead to the reality that we would need to, on an ongoing basis, feed on the body and the blood of Christ. Of course, we don't believe that this is the physical, material body of Christ but we do believe that by his Holy Spirit, when we feed on this bread and we feed on and we drink from this cup, that by his spirit, we are united to him in intimacy, that the benefits of his body and his blood given are absolutely given to us and we don't just possess them, we experience them and they take hold of us as we take hold of them. And so, as you prepare to come to this table, come prepared, expectant and hopeful that as we eat this body, we drink this blood, that your soul will in fact be nourished with eternal life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to acknowledge that There are mysteries that are beautiful and profound, and even as we try to wrap our heads around this mystery, we we really need more our hearts and our wills and our souls to receive the gift that you have for us. Lord God, as we prepare to come to receive this real food and this real drink, give us eyes to see the ways that we have substituted artificial food. Lord, hear us in this moment as we confess to you the ways that we have sought satisfaction and comfort and meaning and control, the ways that we've tried to make life work apart from you. Lord, hear our confession silently and forgive us. Lord, as we look at our lives, none of those things can satisfy us. You alone have the words of eternal life. You alone have bought with your body and blood eternal life that can satisfy and nourish our souls. So as we come to meet you at this table, Holy Spirit, unite us. Unite us with Christ and feed our souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.